All right, let's continue our discussion uh, last time. When we talk about the, the rational Laplace transform. And for this type of Laplace transform, we, uh, we can define the zeros and poles. And then, uh, as we have uh, discussed before, the most important thing for a Laplace transform is the region of convergence. And the ROC is always uh, a vertical, either a vertical uh, half, half plane or a vertical strip, depending on the type of signal. So here we have some uh, basic rules. If the signal is right-sided, then uh, ROC will also be right-sided. And if the signal is left-sided, ROC is also left-sided. And moreover, for, uh, for rational Laplace transform, the region of convergence can be determined by looking at the poles. So basically, if we have a rational, if we have a right-sided signal and the Laplace transform is rational, it's in a rational form, then the ROC must be the must be to the right of the rightmost pole. So first of all, it has to be right-sided because the signal is right-sided. And moreover, because it's rational form, in the rational form, so the poles uh, serve as a boundary of the region of convergence. So by considering these two factors, the, the ROC must be uh, must be to the right of the rightmost pole. And on the other hand, if the signal is left-sided, then uh, then ROC is to the left of the le leftmost pole. So this gives us a way to understand the signal from by looking at this uh, Laplace transform and the, the region of convergence. Okay, so based on these uh, simple rules, we can we can start to talk about the inverse Laplace transform. So in general, the, the inverse Laplace transform is defined in this way. So it's gi given the Laplace transform, now we are taking, we are evaluating this integration to obtain the original signal. So you can see it is like, uh, this is similar, kind of similar to the inverse Fourier transform. So these are the eigen signals, e to the power of st. And we are summing up all these different eigen signals uh, with the corresponding coefficient specified by the Laplace transform. Okay, so this is a kind of like a linear combination of all these eigen signals. And summing them up, we will get back to the time domain, time domain signal. But the, the, here, the challenge here is the integration. So evaluating this integration is actually uh, very complicated because it corresponds to a, uh, integration in the 2D plane. So, 
So directly calculating the inverse Laplace transform is, uh, is not the scope uh, of this course. Here we will need uh, counter integration in the, in the two dimensional uh, complex plane. It's not even a real plane. Right? So the integration is from sigma minus j infinity to sigma plus j infinity. So it's like a two dimensional complex plane. So what, what we will do is to leverage some existing uh, Laplace transform pairs and also leveraging the, the, the properties of, of the Laplace transform to identify the, the inverse. For example, uh, these two here, we, we have seen this in the Fourier transform, uh, Fourier transform pairs. So these two would be the two Laplace transform pairs that we will see uh, frequently. So this signal, this causal signal uh, corresponds to such a Laplace transform with this region of convergence. And this one corresponds to the same Laplace transform but with a completely different region of convergence. So this is our uh, basis. And now let's look at some examples uh, of finding the uh, calculating the inverse of Laplace transform. So given such a Laplace transform with a corresponding uh, region of convergence, we want to find out the time domain signal, corresponding time domain signal. So here, We can see that this Laplace transform is given in a rational form. Right, because we have polynomials in the numerator and denominator. So, and, and then we can see that uh, this one, we can easily tell that there are two poles, it's negative one and negative two. So we can sketch them on the 2D plane. So negative one is here and negative two is here. So these are the two poles. And we are given the ROC is between, uh, between negative one and negative two. So it's a vertical, vertical strip. So the real part of S, which is this sigma, right? This six sigma is between negative one and negative two. So the ROC is given by this vertical strip. Okay, so uh, the basic idea is similar to uh, the calculating the inverse Fourier transform. We first do a partial fraction expansion. So this is this is the partial fraction expansion. <clears throat> and then we can decompose this into two smaller fraction numbers. Then for each one, we can refer to this table to find out the inverse. However, the only difference, the only thing that you need to pay additional attention to is the region of convergence. Because when you, when you apply uh, this transformation pairs, you have to specify uh, the region of convergence. So that's the only difference. Otherwise, these two, these two, they have the same Laplace transform. So you won't, you will not be able to tell which signal are you looking at. So the key is to identify the, the, the correct region of convergence. Okay. So, so now let's look at this one. So after a simple, after partial fraction expansion, we get, we can decompose it in, into this form. And then we need to, we need to start, uh, we need to analyze the region of convergence. So we are given, so this region, region of convergence is kind of like the overall region of convergence for the entire uh, Laplace transform. And based on this, we need, to, we need to identify the corresponding ROC 
for each of these components. So because because the first in the in the first part we have uh, this is again in a fraction in a rational form it's one over s plus one. So this one this fraction number right it has a single pole, which is s equals to negative one. So we can we can then we can uh, we can tell that the corresponding ROC has to be. this one the real part of s is less than negative one because in in the if you look at so first of all you look at the overall region of convergence right which is this vertical strip but now this is this uh, this roc is is determined by the region of convergence for both parts and clearly you can see that for the first part it has it has a single pole, which is negative one. And here is the negative one, the, the pole at negative one. So the corresponding ROC for the first component um, would be on, related to only this uh, negative one pole. And by looking at this, this region of convergence, so the corresponding ROC is to the left of this pole. And similarly for the second one, because it has a pole negative two right here. So by looking at this overall region of convergence, we can tell that the corresponding ROC is to the right of negative two. Okay, so this is how you identify, right? We start from the the overall Laplace transform and the overall ROC. Then we do a partial fraction expansion, decompose it into two parts. And then by, lo by looking at the poles of these two parts and also looking at the overall region of convergence, we can identify their corresponding regions of convergence. So for the first one, the ROC should be to the left of the corresponding pole, negative one. And for the first fraction number, the ROC should be to the right from this picture to the right of the second uh, of the pole at negative two. So this is how you identify the corresponding regions of convergence. Now, once you, once you identify that, the rest is to apply the, refer to the table. Right. So now you have this one. Now you have a Laplace transform and this corresponding region of convergence. So you go back to the table. Clearly, you can apply the first one and find corresponding. Uh, oh, you should you should apply the second one actually because the ROC is to the left, right? Is to the left of negative one. So applying the second pair. In this case, A should be one, right? A should be one. So here's negative one and here's one. So the corresponding signal is E to negative E to the power of negative T, U negative T. So that is the first part. And for the second part, because the ROC is to the right, so you need to apply the first transformation pair. And you can see that A corresponds to A equals to two in this case. Now, if A equals to two, the signal is e to the power of negative two t u t. Okay, so this is the final result. So you can see that the, the these standard steps uh, are very similar to the inverse Fourier transform, but you need to pay additional attention to the region of convergence. Okay, so once you do a partial flexor expansion, you need to identify their corresponding region of convergence for each fraction number. 
Okay, so this is the critical part. Okay, so this is the case when we are given, when the ROC is given to be this, this vertical strip between negative two and negative one. So here's another question. We have comments. How can we tell if the function is right-sided or left-sided? Well, yes, that's a that's a good question. So if we look at if you look at this one, right, at this step, one once you have the once you identify the corresponding region of convergence, now you can look at this particular Laplace transform and uh, the associated region of convergence. You can see that the region of convergence is left-sided because it's to the left of negative one. So the ROC is left-sided. Now for, and also looking at this fraction number, looking at this Laplace transform, it is in a rational form, right? So we have a rule saying that if X, if the Laplace transform is rational and, and ROC is left-sided, then the signal is left-sided. Okay. So here we have a rational Laplace transform with a, uh, with a left-sided region of convergence. So that means the signal would be left-sided. And, and this is indeed the case because if you apply, once you apply that, uh, refer to the table, the signal, this signal that you uh, you find out is indeed left-sided because we have a U negative T. We have a, this U negative T is the well-preserved all the, all the signals in the negative time domain. So this is a left-sided signal. But so th these are consistent with this. This observation is consistent with these rules. We have a rational Laplace transform with a corresponding left-sided ROC. So we the, the resulting signal has to be left-sided. But you can just refer to the table because now you you have a the Laplace transform and ROC is clear. So the the inverse is also clear. And looking at this one you have the same observation, it's also consistent. You also have a rational Laplace transform, but now this one, the region of convergence is right-sided. And by this rule, you can see that, okay, the signal has to be right-sided. The corresponding signal has to be right-sided. And indeed, once you refer to the table, you will see that, yes, the signal is right-sided because, because of this UT. Right. And moreover, now going back to, if you, if you just look at the entire uh, Laplace transform. So we have, we, have a, we have this big Laplace transform, which is again in the rational form. And the corresponding ROC, the, the given ROC is a vertical strip between negative one and negative two. So in this case, ROC is a vertical strip. Okay, the ROC is a vertical strip. And by this rule, the signal has to be two-sided, two-sided. And if you look at the final result that we found, but we, the, the final result, that, the final signal that we identified is the sum of a left-sided signal and a, and a right-sided signal. So this entire signal is a two-sided signal. Okay, so all these are consistent uh, with these basic rules. Yeah, so to summarize, the, the, the side of the signal will be determined by the, the type of the ROC, right? The, if the ROC is right-sided, the signal is right-sided and vice versa.
And we can look at, uh, let's look at this additional question. How does the solution change if the given ROC is to the right of negative one or to the left of negative two? So instead of giving a vertical strip, we are now looking at uh, these, these two different cases. So let's take a look at these two cases. So we know that XS is one over S plus one, minus one over S plus two. Now, if the ROC is given as this one, okay. So instead of, have, instead of having this vertical strip, now the region of convergence by right, this is negative one and this is negative two. Now the region of convergence is to the right, is given as to the right of negative one. Okay, so it's no longer that vertical strip. So given given this Laplace transform, given this ROC, what is the corresponding uh, universe? What is the corresponding uh, signal in the time domain? So again, we should look at uh, we should look at each one, each individual uh, fraction number and then trying to figure out the corresponding region of convergence uh, based on the given overall region of convergence. Now for the S, for the uh, one over S plus one, for this one, we know that the, it has a single pole, which is exactly as negative one. And I also is given as to the right of negative one. So this, this, is, this already corresponds to the Region of convergence. Right, because the pole is exactly negative one. So this means that for the first for the first fraction number, for the first part, the region of convergence is given as to the right of negative one. And then we can we can refer to the table, find the inverse. Now for the second one, it's a little bit tricky here. So the, so the pole here is actually at negative two. But the, the given region of convergence um, does not depend on negative two. Right, so, so this given ROC is, uh, depends on the another pole. So how, how do we figure out the region, the corresponding ROC in this case? Well, uh, I think here the logic is, is as follows, right? So the, let's say, okay, let's call this ROC and let's call this ROC1 and let's call this as ROC2. Okay, the, the ROC of the first component, the first fraction number and ROC of the second fraction number. So the over, and this is the overall ROC. The underlying logic is that starting from um, the overall ROC must be the intersection of ROC1 and ROC2. And if you look at the second one, because the, for the second uh, Laplace transform, it has a single pole, a negative two. 
So for this Laplace transform, there are only two types of ROC. Either is to the left of negative two or is to the right of negative two. Right, because it, because it is in the rational form. So that's the only two cases we can have. And then now suppose suppose the ROC is to the left of negative two, and then uh, it will lead it will lead to a contradictory because uh, if the ROC is to the left of negative two, and at the same time for the first part the ROC is to, to the right of negative one, so these two ROCs they do not overlap, so that that will imply an empty overall region of convergence. Okay, so this case. So th this case is not uh, does not hold, should not hold. So that implies that uh, for for this case we can only have the ROC two is to the right of negative two. So this is the only case we can have, and then. And, th and then you can see that this is consistent because in now, if you take intersection of these two, you indeed, you will get the same overall region of convergence because this one is stronger. Well, it's to the right of negative one. This one is stronger than, than this ROC. Or well, from the figure, you can see that the, the red one, this one covers the first ROC. So by taking intersection, the overall ROC would be to the right of negative one only. Okay, so in this case, this ROC is implicitly, is implicit, is implicit, but you need to, you can find, find it out by leveraging the basic rules of ROC, right? It has to be a vertical, vertical line. The boundary has to be a vertical line and because it's rational, so, and we only have a single pole. So there are only two possible ROCs to the left of negative two or to the right of negative two. And then by analyzing each case, you, you realize that there's, there's only one case that can hold in this case. Okay, so you start from this overall ROC, and finally we can get these two pairs of uh, at least two Laplace transforms. And with these two, we can go back to the table and figure out their corresponding uh, inverse. So in this case, you can see that both of these Laplace transform are have right-sided ROC, which means the underlying signal is right-sided. So let, let's take a look at that table and write it out. I think it is not a piecewise function. So the, the signal is, we just basically do these two parts one by one. The first part, a uh, so we for both parts, because the ROC is right-sided, Right, so we have we need to apply the first table, the first line, the first pair. And here A corresponds to one. Right? For the first for the first case, A corresponds to one. So the uh, the corresponding signal is is this one. Now for the second case, the A equals to two. So we have this signal. And then we have a negative sign here. So this is minus, this is minus. So you can see that now we have, now the signal is right-sided, is right-sided. And this signal is completely different from what we have here. Here we have a two-sided signal, but here we have a right-sided signal, right? Because the ROC is given as right-sided. So again, you can see that uh, for different ROCs, this 
the corresponding signal can be completely different. So now let's quickly look at the last case. What if the ROC is given as to the left of negative two? Okay, now the ROC, the overall ROC is given as to the left of negative two. Now in this case, because negative two corresponds to uh, a pole, one of the poles specifically corresponds to the pole of this, this Laplace transform. So the, so it is easier to identify the region of convergence for the second one. Okay, so this is this is basically the ROC for the second one, because negative two is exactly the pole of this Laplace transform. And again, in this case, for the first one. Uh, because the pole is negative one, it's different from negative two. So its corresponding ROC is implicit. And again, you can just consider two cases. Uh, because uh, for the first one, we only have a single pole, which is negative one. And it is uh, in a rational form. So, the, so its corresponding ROC is either to the left of negative one or to the right of negative one. However, the second case cannot hold because if the if the ROC is to the right of negative one, then it will not it will not overlap with the, with this ROC with the overall ROC. Okay, so that's a contradictory case. So the only case we can have is to the left of negative one. So the ROC one, ROC one is the red, is the red region, and ROC two is the is the black region. And once you take intersection, we can see that the ROC one covers ROC two. So by taking intersection, the overall ROC is is simply ROC two. So this is how you identify the implicit region of convergence in this case. Uh, now, after that, you just refer to the table, right? So you go back to this table, go back to this table. Now, both of these uh, Laplace transform has have left-sided ROC, have left-sided ROC. So we need to apply and this pair of transformation. Now looking at ROC one, looking at the first one, uh, the A, the A should be one. And then going back, the corresponding signal is E uh, negative E to the power of negative T U negative T. And for the second Laplace transform, a equals to two. So going back, the signal is negative e to the power of negative two t u t u negative t. And then there are there's a minor sign in between, so we just add another minus, and these two cancel out. So we get a plus. So this is the final signal. And you can see that this is a left-sided signal, left-sided signal.
Okay. So the tricky part, right? The tricky part, partial fracturing expansion is standard. Okay, you just follow the follow what, what we have done in the Fourier transform. This is standard. The tricky part is from the given the overall region of convergence, how do we identify the corresponding region of convergence uh, of these different Laplace parts of the Laplace transform? So this is a tricky part. Okay, so any questions? We have another comment. So the ROC is where the function converges. Is this the bands that you have been making, marking in for the sidewalk? So the so in this in these pictures, right, uh, the ROC uh, correspond to, to the sh uh, shaded areas. Like in the first case, in the first case, the overall ROC is given is given as this vertical strip, and then we uh, and then we figure out that the corresponding region of convergence associated with. Uh, each of these Laplace transform is a, either a left half plane or a right half plane. So, if, so I can I can actually draw another. So let me. So what happens is that for the first one, the ROC is to the left of negative one. So I can. So it's the, this red region. And for the second one, ROC is to the right of negative two. So it's this green region. Right. And so the overall ROC is the intersection of these two, which, is, which corresponds to that vertical strip between negative one and negative two. So given this, given the overall ROC, you need to go back and find out their corresponding ROCs by looking at their, uh, their corresponding, corresponding poles. So if we're given the transform equation like we are in this example, it'll also give us the ROC, correct? Yes, usually, yeah, this has to be given at first. Okay. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So we are given the overall ROC, but then you need to analyze and figure out. So after the partial fracturing expansion, you need to analyze this overall ROC and figure out what are the corresponding ROCs associated with each part. So you just look at, look at this given ROC, you can visualize it, and then look at, uh, look at the corresponding poles of, of each of these parts. So in this in this example, is, it is very clear because the, for the first one, uh, it, only, it has a single pole, negative one, and that and the ROC, the overall ROC already tells you the corresponding uh, ROC. And for the second one, the, it has a pole negative two, so here it is also clear. This is a corresponding ROC. But for these cases, but for these cases, uh, it looks like the overall ROC only involves one pole, but actually uh, it, the other one is implicit, is implicit. Okay, because what happens is the other one is covered, is included in the first ROC. So after intersection, after taking the section, uh, this ROC disappears in the overall ROC. So you, you need to analyze that and figure out this implicit region of convergence for this one. Okay. So this is the, 
inverse Laplace transform. And, and uh, very naturally, because Laplace transform generalizes Fourier transform, so it naturally inherits most of the nice properties of Fourier transform. So here we will go over them one by one. We have this linearity. We have seen this, seen this everywhere in this course. But if you add up two signals, linearly add up two signals, uh, so the corresponding Laplace transform will also add up. However, as we, uh, here I want to emphasize again that always, you need to always pay attention to the region of convergence. But when you add up two signals, well, their corresponding Laplace transform will also uh, linearly combine in the, in the same way. However, you need to consider the, the now the region of convergence is at least their intersection. So it's at least their intersection because you need to make sure you need to make sure uh, both parts will converge simultaneously. And in most cases, uh, this would be, it, it suffices to consider their intersection because it, what, so, okay, the, the logic is that X1 need to converge. So we need to consider, so this one has an ROC1 and yt also need to converge in the Laplace transform. So this one has ROC2. Now in order for, in order for both to be convergent, you need to consider their intersection. However, in some special cases, maybe once you add them up, some part of, uh, some part of their Laplace transform may cancel with each other. So in the end, the ROC may be slightly uh, bigger. So for example, here are two signals, X1T and X2T, with their corresponding ROC given as follows. These are all given, okay? Now we subtract X, X2 from X1, but consider XT as X1T minus X2T. Now, what is the result? What is the corresponding Laplace transform of XT? Well, you apply the linearity. So the Laplace transform is basically X1 minus X2. So it's x1, x1 is one over s plus one minus x2 is one over s plus one times s plus two, right? And then we know that uh, we are given that for the, for the x1, the ROC is uh, to the right of negative one. And for this one, the ROC is to the, again, to the right of negative one. And, and, and it looks like if you just, if you consider their intersection, uh, they are the same, right? So taking intersections, we still have the same ROC. So it looks like uh, taking intersection will give us the uh, region of convergence. However, this case is a little bit tricky because if you calculate this, If this can be further simplified because if you do, do a simple calculation, now I multiply here by S plus two. So I have S plus two minus one, which gives me an S plus one in the, denom in the numerator. And that will cancel with the S plus one in the denominator. So in the end, I get rid of that pole as negative one. Right, so I, I only have this single pole now. So after simplification, you can see that nft one is no longer a pole. So the ROC should, 
is actually bigger than this one. So in this case, the ROC is bigger than negative two instead of negative one, okay, because this one is canceled out, canceled out. And, and so these are very special cases, but for most cases, uh, it suffices to consider that they are intersection. Okay, so this is a linearity. We have this time shifting property. Uh, these are exactly the same as the, the, the properties in the Fourier transform. Time shifting, time shift corresponds to, will, will lead to a phase shift in the S domain. And the ROC is the, is the same, uh, it remains the same. And a modulation in time, right? XT times E to the power ST. This is a modulation in time will lead to a frequency shift in the S domain. And here the ROC will also be shifted, right? Because originally XS has a, maybe a certain ROC. Now we are looking at X, S minus S naught. So this is a shifted, the, the, the entire domain is shifted by S naught. So the corresponding ROC would be the original one shifted by, by the real part of S naught, because ROC is also, it's always vertical. And time scaling, if we multiply, if we scale in time, then we will, we will also scale in this way in the S domain. And moreover, the ROC will also be scaled by A. So all you, all you have to pay attention to is, again, the, you know, the, the possible change of this region of convergence, because all the other, these formulas are exactly the same as uh, what we have in, in the Fourier transform. Okay. And this is conjugation, well, it's the same as Fourier transform. And this convolution is you know, the, the most important one probably. So if we have two signals and their corresponding Laplace transform, as well as the corresponding region of convergence. But suppose these two are given, these are given, and then consider their convolution. And we can, we can show that this signal, this convolved signal has a Laplace transform even by X1 multiplied by X2, okay? So, this is the same as the Fourier transform. And again, the ROC in most cases is the intersection of the of these two ROCs. But in some special cases, it may be uh, bigger because it may happen when you multiply these two Laplace transforms, some, some terms cancels out and you can get rid of some of the poles. Like this is one example. This is one example. X1, X2, they have their corresponding ROCs. However, X1 is one over X2. So once you multiply them together, they can everything cancels out and you get a constant one, right? So there's no pose anymore. So the ROC is the entire S domain. Again, these are very special the special cases. Okay, a very good question. Do zeros play into determining the ROC? No, the answer is no, because zeros makes the Laplace transform to be zero. And zero is a convergent number, but it is not infinity. So only the poles plays the role in the region of convergence. Okay, I think I missed this comment from Tristan. So is the ROC of, the, of this one example, the intersection of ROC1 and ROC2, just like, yes, yes. 
that is the intersection of these two. So one of them will cover the others. So in the end, once you take intersection, uh, only this one remains. So this again, this, this uh, th so this is really the fundamental property that we, we want to have for the Laplace transform, so that we can we can utilize it to analyze LTI systems. It's because the LTI systems are described by convolution, right? And so 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 what happens here is that remember previously we utilized Fourier transform to uh, to analyze LTI systems. So why do we why do we need Laplace transform here? Seems like Laplace transform has the same properties. Well, the the point is that we know that Laplace transform generalizes Fourier transform. So applying Laplace transform is always so it's no worse than no Fourier transform. We have this <coughs> differentiation property. Differentiation in time will lead to uh, this multi simple uh, scaling in the S domain. So, therefore, we, in uh, later we will see a lot of examples uh, applying Laplace transform to analyze partial differential equations. And this is a this is differentiation in the S domain. Okay, differentiation in S corresponds to uh, multiplication in time. This is scaling in time, linear scaling in time. Okay, now here is an example. We want to find out the Laplace transform of this signal. Okay, so T times this exponential signal. Now, from the previous examples, we, we know that we are familiar with the with the Laplace transform of this signal. Okay. And now we need to look at now this xt is t times this signal. So this reminds us, this motivates us to use this differentiation in S domain property. Because in this property, we have a signal times by T. The signal is multiplied by T, right? So, so here we will consider use this property. So first of all, from the table, we know that this signal corresponds to this Laplace transform with this RC. And then we apply this differentiation in the S domain property. Therefore, uh, T times this signal corresponds to uh, a differentiation now in the S domain corresponds to the, 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 taking the original Laplace transform and take and uh, take a differentiation with regard to S in the S domain. And here we have a negative sign because in this formula, we have negative sign on the left-hand side. So we can move it to the right, to the right-hand side. And after that, we get such a Laplace transform. And the ROC remains the same, it doesn't change. Okay, so directly applying this property, we, we can conclude that such a signal has a Laplace transform with a higher order, it's order of two. And this is the integration in time, integration property, right? So integration of the signal from negative infinity to up to T will lead to such a Laplace transform. And the ROC is given, is given in this way. Is the original RLC intersect with the 
right half plane in the S domain. And this is because why do we have this additional intersection? This is because this integration, we can rewrite it as such a convolution. Okay, you can check by the definition of convolution. This is exactly the convolution of xt and the and ut, okay, xt and ut. And then by the convolution property of Laplace transform, um, we know that the so, so first of all we know ut has a Laplace transform one over s, and the corresponding ROC is the positive, the right half plane. And then by the convolution property of Laplace transform, right, uh, the, the resulting Laplace transform is the product of the individual Laplace transforms. And I'll see we'll need to you know, take intersection. So that's why we have the inter intersection here. One comes from the original signal, and this one comes from this UT. This UT is implicitly uh, involved in this integration. And moreover, we have this initial and final value theorem. Um, I, I don't, so this, uh, I don't, I don't think we need it in the homeworks, but these are good to know. So if xt is a causal signal, xt equal to zero for t negative, this means xt is a causal signal. If xt is causal, then the initial value of x, by x at zero positive, which is the initial value of x, equals to this limit is s times Laplace transform taking the limit to infinity in initial value theorem. And then we have this another corresponding to the final value theorem. Which says again, if the signal is, is causal signal, then the final value, which is the limit of xt, the final value corresponds to the initial value of s times xs. So this means that if we consider Laplace transform, uh, the boundary conditions, the initial condition or the boundary conditions of the signal can be related to the Laplace transform in the S domain. And later we will see uh, when we introduce the unilateral Laplace transform, we will see more applications there. Okay. <laughs> and then we can start to talk about LTS systems because uh, the Laplace transform also has that very nice convolution property. So this is an LTS system, right? The input is X, impulse response, system impulse response is H, and output is Y. Now the output is convolution between X and H. So this is a time domain system equation. Now we can take Laplace transform on both sides. Take Laplace transform. So we have capital YS equals to, now by the convolution property, the convolution in time is transformed into multiplication in the S domain. Okay, so this is the equation in the S domain. And this is more general than the Fourier transform because in Fourier transform, we only consider this equation uh, restricting on the Y axis, right? on the imaginary axis. But now on the Laplace transform, we can discuss this in the entire complex domain. <clears throat> and again, again, we have this eigenfunction uh, property. So if X is exponential signal, 
then the corresponding output is a scaled version of this exponential signal. And similar to the Fourier transform, mm -hmm. similar to the to the discussion in I think in lecture four or lecture three, when well, well we sh we we showed that the many fundamental properties of LTS systems can be. Can be understood in by looking at the system response. Oh, I think we mentioned we discussed this in the Fourier transform time. Yeah. So here we can have the same story here. For example, we can so, so we can analyze the cause causality of a system by looking at the system response in the S domain. So here record that a causal system is defined as a system at the LTI system where the corresponding system impulse response is a causal signal. Right. So this impulse response is a causal signal. This is a definition. And then if you look at this definition, HT causal means that HT is left-sided, uh, sorry, it's right-sided, right? Because if HT is a causal signal, means that the signal can only occur in the positive time domain, which means HT is right-sided. Now, if, if HT is right-sided, that means when we take Laplace transform of such a impulse response, then the corresponding ROC is, uh, is also right-sided. Yeah. Because causal system, uh, by definition, has a causal impulse, impulse response. And causal implies right side, being right-sided. And we know that any right-sided signal has a right-sided region of convergence in the Laplace transform. And the important fact is that if an, LC, an LTS system has a rational Laplace transform of the impulse response, then causality is equivalent to the fact that the ROC is, is to the right of the rightmost pole. to the roof. Is there a control panel here that we can control the It's weird. Okay, so um so this is a fact where we can so where we can de determine the causality of a system by looking at the the ROC of the corresponding Laplace transform of the under of the corresponding uh, impulse response. And this is uh, here I should know that this only uh, this only applies to rational Laplace transform, rational Laplace transforms. Without this, in general, uh, this does not guarantee the causality of the system. So it has to be rational. This is very important. And here we have some examples uh, corresponding to this point. So let's say we are given an LTS system with this uh, impulse response. 
So we can see that this impulse response is causal, is a causal signal. The causal signal, right? So by definition, this is a causal LTS system, by definition. And then we can verify this fact by looking at the Laplace transform. Okay. So given this signal, we can calculate the Laplace transform. Okay, refer to the table. We have this Laplace transform and we have this region of convergence, right? This ROC is right-sided because the signal is right-sided, right? They are consistent. Okay. Now we have this Laplace transform and region of convergence. Looking at this Laplace transform, it is a rational, it is in a rational form. Right? It's one over S plus one. Everything is polynomial, is in the rational form. Therefore, the region of convergence is to the right of the rightmost pole, and which is indeed the case, is to the right, to the single pole, the only pole, negative one. So this is the only pole, which is also the rightmost pole. Therefore, all these conditions are satisfied. Uh, all the conditions in this fact are satisfied. We have a rational Laplace transform and ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole. And then we can conclude that this system is a causal system. But this is consistent uh, with the definition, with the observation from the definition. Now here's another counter example uh, for this one. Well, we have, we are given, we are given such a, we are, we are given a LTS system and the, for the impulse response, the corresponding Laplace transform is given as follows. The Laplace transform of the impulse response takes this form and the region of convergence is to the right of nft one uh, Here is the nft one is the pole of this Laplace transform. So we can see that first of all, the ROC is indeed to the right of the rightmost pole. But because again, we only have a single pole here, nft one So it's to the right of the rightmost pole. However, in this case, H2 is not in a rational form because in the numerator, we have exponential. Exponential is not a polynomial. So this is not a rational form, <clears throat> which means this fact may not apply. This fact may not apply, but it requires rational, rational uh, Laplace transform. So now, now let's, let's take a look at the Let's go, let's try to find out the impulse response. And from there, we can, we can understand the causality of the system. So from given this Laplace transform, right? We have the Laplace transform, we have the ROC. We can try to find out the inverse. So first of all, uh, from the table, we know that, so the, here the ROC is right-sided. So looking at that, the, the pair of transform with a right-sided ROC, this is the transformation that we are looking at. Right, so one over S plus one, this Laplace transform gives uh, such a inverse signal. However, we have an e to the power of s in the numerator. So we need to, somehow we need to introduce, <coughs> we need to introduce factor in the numerator. And this is done by the time shifting property, right? So introduce an exponential in the frequency domain. The only way is to think about time shifting. So based on this given pair of Laplace transform and we apply time shifting property, we can, we can derive that so in order to introduce the e to the power of s in the numerator, I need to shift the signal in time by one. Okay. So by the time shifting property, we can conclude that the corresponding inverse 
the signal that that corresponds to this Laplace transform takes this form. Right. Therefore, this is the impulse in response of this LTI system. And from the from from here, you can see that because of ut plus one, this is a shifted step function to the left by one unit. <coughs> Therefore, the signal is not causal right? because it starts from negative one instead of zero. So this is not a causal signal. This is not a causal impulse response, meaning that this LTI system is not causal. So this is a counter example that shows that rationality is really, really important in this fact. Being rational is very important. Okay, this is causality, right? So this is a fact that you can you can utilize to to determine the causality of the LTS system. Stable, and well, we can also talk about the stability of the LTS system. And in the, when we introduce the LTS systems, we know that stability means that the impulse response is absolutely integratable, right? This is a sufficient, sufficient condition. And based on this definition, we can have the following observation. An LTS system is stable if and only if so this is a necessary and sufficient condition, even only if the region of convergence of HS. Now HS is the Laplace transform of the corresponding impulse response. Right? So looking at the region of convergence of the of HS, if the ROC includes the y-axis, includes the imaginary y-axis, then the system is stable. Because, uh, because uh, with this fact, we can derive, we can show that the response is absolutely integrable. Okay. So if you... Okay. So, so here we have two facts. First of all, causality, in order to be causal um, for an LTS system that has a rational Laplace transform, the ROC must be to the right of the rightmost pole. Now, in order to be stable, the ROC must include the y-axis. So if you combine them, we can talk about a causal and stable LTS system, right? That is causal and stable are two very important very fundamental properties for many LTS systems. So, okay, now we can combine these two, put them together, and we can obtain this. Uh, uh, this is a big claim. Causality, causal and stable LTS system. If, so let me, let me rephrase this, uh, Paragraph. So if, if uh, so, let's look at LTS system that has a rational uh, HS. For such an LTS system, if we want if we want a system to be causal and stable, then this is what we need. We need all the poles of HS, right? Because it's a, it has a rational HS, so we have the poles. If all the poles are in the left half plane, if all the poles are in the left half plane, so 
So if all the posts are uh, strictly in the left half plane, then the system is causal and stable. Why, on, on one hand, because all the posts are in the left half plane, uh, <clears throat> then now the only way that our, the only possibility for the ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole. Uh, because ROC should not contain any poles. So this is the only possibility to the right of the rightmost pole. So first of all, it is to the right of the rightmost pole. So it's right-sided. Now, second of all, because the poles are strictly in the left half plane, so the ROC must contain a y-axis. Right. So, so both conditions are satisfied. Right. Containing y-axis means the system is stable, and to the right of the rightmost pole means that the system is causal. So you combine them, combine them all together. You, you have this very, very, uh, very elegant uh, result. So if we want to have a causal and a stable LTS system that has a rational Laplace transform, just look at the poles. If the poles are all on the left, in the left half plane, then you are done, then you are good. Okay, so I think um, I have two minutes to try to cover this. So let's say we have given such a, a Laplace transform of the impulse response. Okay, we can do a, now this is, this is a partial fraction expansion. But depending on the ROC, the system may have different properties. Uh, if the system, if we want the system to be causal, then going back to the first result, a causal LTS system with a rational Laplace transform, we must have, we must have that the ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole. So if we want the system to be causal, the ROC must be to the right of the rightmost pole, which is two in this case. Now, once we have this ROC, we can go back and find out the inverse of this uh, of this Laplace transform, and turns out this is the inverse. So this would be the corresponding system impulse response. However, in this case, the system is not stable because the ROC does not contain the y-axis. Right, it's to the right of two, which does not contain the y-axis. So this is a causal but not stable. And in the second case, if we want the system to be stable, then the ROC must contain the y-axis. But now we have two poles. We have two poles, which one is negative one, one is two. So the only way that we contain the y-axis is to let ROC to be the vertical strip between them. So if we want to, if we want the system to be stable, then the ROC, the only possibility is that the ROC is such a vertical strip. Right. And then we have the ROC, we can find out the inverse. Now it turns out the corresponding impulse response is given as, as this one. And moreover, uh, in, in this case, if we consider ROC to be to the left of negative one, uh, then it is neither stable nor causal. So it violates both conditions. Okay. So this is a very nice example. Well, um, given a Laplace transform, you can identify the, the ROCs corresponding to different systems, causal system, stable system. 
they will have different ROCs. And from there, you can identify their corresponding uh, system impulse response. Okay, so we will go back to we will go back to this example again next time. So I think I will stop here today. Okay, I'll see you guys uh, next Tuesday.